Hello and good morning, everyone. This is Ella Hislop, and welcome to Connect Montana. Wait a second. Hi, everybody. This is Chris Hislop <laughs> from the Montana World Affairs Council. That was my daughter, Ella Hislop, who is joining us today, listening in. Hope you are all well, and thank you so much for joining us. It's an extraordinary week again here at Connect Montana. On Tuesday, we were very lucky to have Helena Mayor Wilmot Collins come and share his perspectives and his views on the international dimensions of our state, talking about his own story, having grown up in Liberia, moving here, joining the military, uh, becoming mayor of Helena, and his work and his service in the community. It's quite an extraordinary perspective. If you missed that show and any other show we've had here on Connect Montana, you can check it out at our YouTube channel. Just Google that and you'll find us. But today, I am very pleased um, to have another exceptional guest. Dr. Ilsa Marie Lee was born in South Africa. She joined Montana State University in the fall of 1989 and is currently serving as Dean of the Honors College. She holds a doctorate in cello performance and pedagogy from the University of Arizona, as well as a master's degree in cello performance, music theory, and composition from Northern Illinois University. Dr. Lee is active as a concert soloist, recitalist, and chamber musician, and performs regularly at the Grand Teton Music Festival in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Dr. Lee founded the MSU Cello Ensemble in 1998. A dedicated teacher, Ilsa Marie has received 12 Excellence in Teaching Awards and the President's Excellence in Teaching Award, as well as the Widely Award for Meritorious Research. She was appointed as director of the Honors Program in 2009 and led the transition from an honors program to college in 2013. Dr. Lee, you are very welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Maybe you could start by telling us a little bit about your background. Over to you. Thank you, Chris, for that lovely introduction. And I'm deeply honored to be here this morning. Um, yes, we're going to go from Liberia to South Africa, crisscrossing the African continent. Um, I was born and raised in South Africa. I'm Afrikaans, so English is my second language. And um, my heritage is kind of an interesting um, background because my family had been there in the tip of South Africa since 1652. My mother was an extraordinary pianist um, and uh, that's where the music comes from. Um, in my senior year at the University of the Witwatersrand, which was an interesting university to graduate from, um, as it was the only institution or among, among the only ones that did not discriminate against anybody to attend the institution during the height of the apartheid era. So that was an education within itself. I actually had to read banned books in South Africa during the apartheid era for as part of my curriculum. But um, in my senior year in, uh, in South Africa, I won an international scholarship to come to the United States to study music. And um, it was a very big step for me to leave South Africa at that point and then come to the United States and study. But that is why I'm a proponent for international education at our universities, because that study abroad opportunity changed my life. And I want to go back earlier to that too. Uh, when I was 16 years old, my mother took my sister and I to Israel. It turns out we have some Jewish ancestry in our family as well. But this brings me again to the point of internalization. Um, nothing brought home South Africa's role in the world during the apartheid era as much as looking at South Africa from a different country. Because during those years in the apartheid era, the press was completely controlled by the government, television. I never saw a South African riot although I lived nine miles from Soweto, but of course I lived in a white neighborhood. But in Israel, I watched the news one evening as a 16 year old, and there was news from Johannesburg, and I saw a riot in Soweto that I'd never seen before. I was flabbergasted and asked my mother to call my dad and hear if he was safe, because look what is happening. The police are opening fire on protesters. So as a South African, I could not see that. So the perspective of leaving and coming back, I think is a very important aspect. Uh, coming to the United States uh, was a wonderful, a wonderful experience. I had access to some of the greatest teachers um, in the world playing the cello, Mitislav Rostropovich, Raya Garbazova, Gordon Epperson, extraordinary people, um, and at public land grant institutions, Northern Illinois University and the University of Arizona. While I gained entrance to prestigious schools, I could never make up the gap. 
but at public land grant institutions, my education was provided to me. At both institutions, I served as a teaching assistant. And then when I finished my doctorate, there were precisely three cello jobs in the country. One of them was at Montana State. I, inter I interviewed at another university, but I must say when I landed in Bozeman, Montana on June 30th, 1989, I could not believe the beauty of the land. And then I met the people. And immediately that interview process was an embrace, welcome, and uh, it, it meant the world to me. So I have taught at Montana State University for 31 years and it's been one of the greatest privileges of my life to have taught here. Um, I'm very happy that I've led study abroad, short-term study abroad opportunities to China, Russia, Europe. Um, I've traveled extensively and any opportunity I've had to take students abroad or to teach them about my native South Africa where we've also traveled to, I think is an incredible education. So there's my little introduction, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Um, it's a really incredible story. And we have heard a couple times on the show, people who have experienced study abroad programs and the ways in which it has changed their lives. And clearly it's had a big impact on your life and your career. But I wonder now from another perspective, so um, you are a Montanan, you're a community member in Bozeman. Could you talk a little bit about the impact of having international students in an institution and in a community? How does that affect the rest of us? Absolutely. I'm so glad you asked me that question because when we talk about internationalization, we always think about traveling, going someplace. But the internationalization of our state, of our communities, of our campuses also happened by bringing those students here. So um, I will just think immediately of two students that came to mind, Chinomso um, Unua from Nigeria, who actually won the award for the most outstanding engineering student in the state of Montana. When he came here, um, literally, um, not with the winter coat in January. It was so incredible to see how the students embraced him here, how they learned that he had never experienced snow before, that he learned how they learned that in his school, he never had access to calculus. And by the end of four years, he was teaching calculus in our math learning circus, so, so center. So just to understand what the lived experience was of those students, for our students to learn that every month, Chernomso was working in the food service here at Montana State University. He was so grateful for that job. And he was a custodian at the, the building where he lived so that our students learned that there's nobility in work. They learned that every month, no matter how little money Chinomso earned, he still sent money home to support his mother and his father and his sister. They learned that his family sold their little car so that he could have an education in the United States. So those things are important for us to learn because we take things for granted. We think that access to our higher education just comes naturally. It does not. So it's so wonderful. He inspired everybody around him with his smile. And by the way, I'm expecting an email from him. Every first of the month, I get an email from Chinomso. I have one more story to say. Chinomso qualified for one of our most prestigious academic scholarships by virtue of working incredibly hard. And when he was ready to leave, he came to me. He's now in a, doing a PhD at the University of Minnesota. And he said, Dr. Lee, I want to thank you for the scholarship. And I said, oh, no, no, no. Chinomso, don't thank me for the scholarship. The people of Montana built this institution. When you go home to Nigeria, please say that the people of Montana at this institution made your education possible. And Chinomso and I both sat back. <laughs> he said, how? In a typical African fashion. And um, so that's the big beauty of it. Um, we have students here from India, particularly a student that I'm thinking of right now, a young woman who had never have had access to this education. Her family's first priority was to educate her brothers. But here at Montana State, she's getting an edu education as a chemical engineer. So yes, people of Montana, we've got something great to offer. And it is the greatest gift that we can give is an education. And at the same time, our students here will learn cultural differences and learn to respect it, but diverse opinions and to understand that there's good in everybody. We can't just alienate people on the base of nationality or skin color or race. We're all human beings. And this COVID-19 pandemic have taught us that we are, there are no borders. This is, this is a crisis facing humanity. Mm. Maybe I could just pick up on that uh, last point, Dr. Lee. It, it, just looking at your student population at MSU, yes. could you just say a few words of um, 
really what kind of impact do uh, you have study abroad students, but you also have um, staff and uh, professional staff who are from other parts of the world. Why does this matter to a, 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 a learning institution? Why is this kind of international perspective and, and diversity of student body and of teaching staff important? What difference does it make? Because, uh, thank you very much for that question. Chris, whether we think of education, whether we think of ag, whether we think of engineering, whether we think of a pandemic, it is very important to our beautiful state. And if we think of climate change as well, that we have a global perspective. Faculty from all over the world that are on this campus bring a perspective that is very important to Montanans. We need to understand how our expertise can be valuable to sub-Saharan African agricultural producers because food security is an international uh, problem. So um, it's actually the greatest threat to our national security is food insecurity and climate change. So if we can share our expertise with farmers in Nigeria and sub-Saharan Sudan, they will be in their home countries. They will be security there. It's, it protects our security. It protects global security. It's very important to understand those cultural differences. And we are not going to go to war if we can have a cultural understanding. I love that I learned from Brooke Anderson, who teaches for us here at Honors um, in the university. Um, she was part of the Iran nuclear treaty negotiation, where the two representatives from Iran and the United States were both MIT graduates. So that type of education is so important. If we wanna bring, we can't be isolated and say only, we're only serving Montana. Montana as a land grant serves Montanans, but it also serves the rest of the world. And once we understand that we're part of this global community and we can help solve global problems, the better it is for Montana. I Dr. hope that helps. It is such a layered question that we can't be isolationist. This is the time where we really have to break those barriers. And I think 100 years from now, people will remember the United States for making education here possible to students from all over the world, because that is how we export the good that is the United States of America. It's a really great point, Dr. Lee. And I have to say, it's been interesting to hear it from different guests on the show. We had the consuls general from both South Korea and Japan. We had a government official from New Zealand um, on not too long ago. All of them in their home countries talking about the same thing, about our current situation in the pandemic and this need to ensure that we have international understanding, international engagement and in these international connections. And speaking of that, you sit at a very interesting nexus in your life. You were born in South Africa and had the, your experience growing up there. Um, you've traveled. Now you are a community member in Bozeman, an academic and a professional musician. All of these things, you know, a very interesting um, connection. Could I pick up a little bit on the last one on your music, Dr. Lee? Could you speak a little bit on, on um, the ways in which um, music your music, your experience in music has made or fostered these kinds of international connections? Great. That's a great question, Chris. Thank you very much for that question. So as a musician, um, you know, music is in an, inter an international language. Music's differ across the world. The Indian gamelan are very far removed from the tonal system that we're used to in the Western United States. But I'll give you an example. In Israel, um, I was a member of the South African National Youth Orchestra, and we gave a joint concert with the Israel Youth Orchestra, National Youth Orchestra. I sat next to an Israeli cellist. I couldn't say hello. I actually was able to say shalom, but <laughs> that was it. But we picked up our cellos and played. And from that moment on, we completely understood what we were saying. I have often experienced that people will be moved by music. In many ways, music supersedes words. And so my music, which is played all over the world, especially love it that it transcends boundaries. I'm a musician. Boundaries. Probably my favorite example of what music can do is that Daniel Barrymore, the conductor, uh, started a, the East Divan Orchestra, which is orchestra consisting of Israeli and Palestinian musicians. And they travel all over the world. And so music can break those barriers down. I also want to say, you know, with internalization, internationalization, um, we also have to know that in Montana, we have sovereign nations. 
And it's very important for our students to travel to our tribal communities and understand the internationalization there and different ways of knowing different cultures. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely critical to our future as well. Yeah, that's that's a little tangent that I wanted to make sure when we spoke about music, I immediately thought of our Native American students here that bring the culture and the music to our campus. When we have our graduation ceremony, we have our tribal singers do an honor song. And right after that, we have the hooding of the doctoral candidates, during which I play solo Bach on my cello. <laughs> so we have this incredible cultural clash that can only happen in Montana, Bach and tribal music. I think that's wonderful. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. Well, let, let me ask you on that one, Dr. Lee, uh, just looking at your, you know, you growing up in South Africa during the time of apartheid, very difficult times um, for, for all people in South Africa. Um, uh, you know, but uh, South Africa went through a, a quite an extraordinary social transformation um, to what it is today. It took a long time. It was certainly not easy. Now, these kinds of transformations occur in any communities and countries around the world. Could you say a few words just from your perspective, having watched what happened in South Africa, are there any, um, from your perspective, any connections to America or Montana in terms of may maybe not on the same scope and scale of social changes as South Africa experienced, but other aspects uh, of that social change and what we might learn from the South African experience? Thank you, Chris. That's a huge question. <laughs> um, I, would, I would say that we have to look for our leaders. We have to find our leaders because as a young person growing up in South Africa, I was absolutely convinced that we were heading for a bloodbath. I did, we watched Angola, we watched the Congo where colonial powers were overthrown. What was difficult in South Africa is that I didn't feel myself as a colonialist, but essentially I am because I'm of Dutch descent and came to the Cape in 1652. So, you know, so it was a very complicated thing for a young person to unpack. You have to understand, and our readers, our listeners, um, viewers, excuse me, um, that Mandela was deemed a terrorist when I was growing up in South Africa. So everything that he said in South Africa was sealed by the government. His own defense during the Ravonia trial was not available to the public to read. I read his defense in Bozeman, Montana in 1989. And when I read that, I realized that is the leader, those words as to what every South African should read. That's what, and so those were, that was also the time that he was in negotiation with F.W. de Klerk. They jointly won the Nobel Peace Prize. And that was the year that Mandela was released. So it was, I'm um, just one saying, look for our leaders. And the South African gov all government was all powerful. They sealed Mandela, Mandela's words. We knew that him as a terrorist, but he was a man of peace. And he was the leader. So we have to look for our leaders. And what is the most incredible thing about leader? Montana, M M Mandela, Mandela, Montana <laughs> stuff. But for Mandela as a leader, that was he was a reconciler. He didn't have one ounce of rancor after he was released from Robben Island prison after 26 years. That was the, one of the first stops I took my students to when we went to South Africa, Montana State students. And we went to Robben Island and we were in his cell to see that to witness that. So we have to look for our leaders. We have to look at leaders that are able to see and be peaceful, non-violent leaders and people that could say to Montana, we, we have a, a compromised past if we think of our history with our tribes and it's not that long ago. And how do we move forward? We recognize the wrongs of the past and then we say, but this is the new country. This is the new ideal. This is the new progress that we can make. And that everybody comes to the table and nobody's excluded. I know this is a this is an ideal, but this is this is something that we can learn. Look for the leaders, try and find the people that are peacemakers. Probably more than what we wanted to delve into, but oh no, I, I mean it's it's very interesting, Dr. Lee, because I think you know you raised it and it, it's a very pertinent point. And you know, just in terms of um, you know, different cultures working together. It's at the very core of certainly what we do in looking at international education and how we can engage Montanans and the world in this kind of a dialogue. Yes. Um, 
could I, if I could pick up a, again on, on this, um, just again, you, it's such a unique perspective that you have that, that you can share with us. In terms of um, um, the MSU and an academic institution, where do, where do our very strong statewide academic institutions fit in, in, um, in these engagements with Native American culture? Um, how do you see that as a, a place, um, a, an environment where, as you say, you know, these connections can be made? Thank you very much. You know, um, so I'm actually a class eight certified teacher in the state of Montana. And when I went through that process to, do, to be able to deliver dual enrollment courses at Montana State, I went through the Indian Education for All modules. And that was phenomenal. And I'm very proud of our state for having that. I think maybe perhaps we should have that at the higher education level too, so that everybody understands this incredible history that we're a part of. I think that would be really critical. I'm very proud of our public institutions um, in Montana and of our universities here because of the freedom of inquiry. Again, I go back to my roots in South Africa where I had to read books that were banned. Fortunately, I had a mother who always had the books. I would go to my mom and say, mom, do you have Cry the Beloved Country? How about a dry white season? And she had all those books and then we'd read them, but that was the expectancy. But here we can read, we can say, we can think what we want. So that's the point of a liberal education to set us free. Nobody will control what we think, how we reason, because that is the way that we make progress as a nation. So academic freedom, critical, and how wonderful that that is part of the education system at Montana State. And University of Montana, all these incredible places that we have. We're so lucky. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, in, indeed we are. And we, we've also, I, I mean, thank you for that perspective because we also spoke with others who are engaged in the university and the education system. And, and you know, that's what brings the Montana World Affairs Council, uh, you know, together with you today is to look at ways in which we can engage students. I wonder just on, on that point, you know, looking at um, the, the public school system in Montana or more broadly, um, if you have any advice um, on ways in which young people, high school students, middle school students, even younger, um, can best be engaged in these kind of conversations about international issues, geography, um, you name it. Um, where do you see opportunities for us to better engage Montana and Montanans on international topics? Great. Thank you, Chris. Um, so. You, I love it that you say I'm a community member in Bozeman because I feel that and I always feel of my, myself as a Montanan with an accent. This is home. There's no question about it. And I've learned that in our public schools, I have a daughter who's just graduating from Bozeman High, that these students um, independently, you know, we live in a flat world, as Thomas Friedman said, with Zoom and Skype. These students adopted a couple of children in Uganda on their own and just basically adopted them in the sense that they're paying for their education. But then they have these Zoom meetings and they learn about that student's lived experience. How many miles he worked to walk to school? How about the cow? How about the family members? How about access to medical? So the world is flat. And so maybe part of the curriculum in, a, in, a, in an AP, AP course could be pick a, a country, pick a community that you're going to outreach to, and you're going to be raising funds for books for these students or clothes or shoes, but just live in that experience and the goodwill that that'll, that'll, that'll bring, but then also for the students to understand, here is a person that's 14 years old, just like me, and what that student is concerned about every day and what I'm concerned about every day, two different worlds. But that is this incredible thing, just as the Montana World's Affairs Council, to make us understand that we are part of a global community. And Montanans, we, this is, it, it, I mean, I've ever, ever seen people that are more welcoming, more embracing, more empathetic. I must say, when Chinomso, our new Nigerian student, his Montanan friends gave him coats, shoes, gave him books, made sure that he was taken care of. Chinomso did not want, actually, one student gave him his car so that he could drive to Minnesota. But I have to say, when Chonomso arrived in Minneapolis, and then immediately the anonymity that he experienced there. And it was a, it was a very tough awakening for Chonomso. So maybe all international students should come to Montana first, and then they'll be ready to go. <laughs> 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 because I must say that Chonomso was embraced by our students here. 
and the same with our Indian student and the other students that I can think of right now too. It's we're, this is a special place, the last best place, right? <laughs> here, here. Well, I mean, it, it, it really echoes what Mayor Collins said also. Um, the really, um, when I asked Mayor Collins, what does Montana have to offer the world? He did mention just what you said, Dr. Lee, which is, you know, this kind of very welcoming aspect uh, of the state and its people to, to be open and willing and understanding um, in the ways that you've described and in, in, in the ways that you've experienced. So I, we're coming down to the, the end of our time here, Dr. Lee. I'll pass over to you for any last words. Maybe I would like to say something in Afrikaans in my language. Please. I'll just say, "Dis wonderlijk in Montana to be is alles van die beste and by donkey. It's wonderful to be in Montana. Everything of the best. And thank you very much. <laughs> that is a lovely way to end. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee, for joining us. It's really been a pleasure to get your perspective on things. Wishing you all the best at MSU and with your music. And to the participants, thanks again for joining. Um, again, this and all of our other shows are on our YouTube and on our Facebook. So if you missed anything or want to share them with your friends, please do. Now we've had a really extraordinary series here. We started out looking um, outside in the world and bringing uh, international guests into our, um, into our webcast. Last week, we looked at Missoulians who have an international perspective. This week, we looked at Montanans uh, with an international perspective. Next week, we have a really amazing group of people who work for organizations or nonprofits who have engagement or operations internationally. So we have, um, for example, Missoula Medical Aid, which has operations in Central America, as does EcoViva, and a number of other organizations. So please um, have a look, join us for that. It's 9.30 uh, every day, Monday through Thursday next week, four shows. Uh, so we would love to see you there. Dr. Lee, once again, I thank you very kindly. Everybody else, thanks for joining and have a good day. Thank you.